Well, thank you very much, uh, Barry, for that introduction, although I do hope that my end is not quite as violent as James Cook's end. Um, Barry, you've been a tremendous supporter of the Australia-India relationship and as Premier and subsequently done a great deal to advance it, and I do want to acknowledge that. I want to thank you all for coming here this afternoon. Uh, I won't repeat all of the acknowledgements that Lee made, but Lee, can I thank CEDA for the opportunity to spruik my report uh, and to acknowledge the great work that CEDA has done over so much, over so many decades in promoting a more complicated understanding of the challenges that Australia faces. I do want to particularly acknowledge the presence here today uh, of my co-panelists, uh, Shamara Kramanaka and Ashok Jacob, uh, both of whom made an outstanding contribution to the reference group uh, that assisted with the framing of this report, although I'll accept all mistakes as mine and not theirs. And Shamara, if I can add my congratulations to the long list of well-wishers on your new appointment. Um, this report has a very simple message. The transformation of the Indian economy is underway. Its progress will be uneven, but the direction is clear and, I believe, irreversible. To realize the opportunities this opens up, we need as a country to make a strategic investment in India, which is backed up with an ambitious, long-term and multi-dimensional Australian strategy driven at the highest levels of government. Australia should set itself the goal by 2035, which is the time frame I've used in this report, to lift India into its top three export markets, the third largest destination in Asia for Australian outward investment, in the inner circle of Australia's strategic partnerships and with people-to-people -people ties as close as any in Asia. So that's, if you like, the broad brush strokes of where we want to get to with India. Now, the analytical punchline in this report, uh, as Lee indicated, is that there is no market, no single market over the next 20 years, which offers more growth opportunities for Australian business than India. And that's why the report sets out a target to treble our exports and to increase by a factor of 10 Australian outward investment uh, into India. That's the size of the opportunity and the key lesson for Australia of India's scale, the momentum which is built into its growth trajectory, and importantly, the underlying complementarity between our two economies. Now, Australian business has long put India in the too hard basket. Its perceptions of, in, of the Indian economy are, in my view, quite dated. There is an understanding of India as a back office, for example, but not as a research and development centre. And there are three overriding reasons why this too hard attitude must change. Scale, complementarity, and spreading risk. So for Australian companies with a global focus, the key question is whether they can afford not to be in what is already the fastest growing large economy in the world. Now, I've deliberately taken a long-term perspective uh, in the report. Uh, a strategy with a roughly 20-year time horizon has to try and capture not just the way India is likely to change and evolve over that period, but also the way in which Australia may change and evolve. So it means plotting the point, the points of intersection of two moving parts. A long view is particularly important when we're dealing with India, uh, because this is a market which, re which requires patience, perspective, and a lot of preparation. And change in India is often invisible to the naked eye, which is one reason why I think perceptions of India tend to be trapped in a bit of a time warp. Um, the opening up of the Indian economy is a very good example. I think we in Australia still tend to see India 
as a relatively closed economy. And yet the India of today is very different to the India of the license Raj, and the India of 2035 is going to be very different again. To give you a couple of examples, in 1990, India's applied tariff was 10 times what it is today. And in 1990, trade as a component of GDP, of GDP in India stood at 13%, and today it stands at just shy of 40%, which is almost exactly the equivalent of Australia. And we see ourselves as a very open trading nation. India needs to be understood very much uh, in its own terms because it will always march to its own tune, whether it's in geopolitics or in economic modeling. It's the only country with the scale to match China, but it's important to understand that India will not be the next China. Indeed, comparisons with China, in my view, only get in the way of understanding the nature of the opportunities in the Indian market. No Indian government will be able to direct the economy in the way China does, nor will it ever have the control over the allocation of resources which has been intrinsic to China's economic success. China has a discipline to its economic planning which flows from its own political system and very importantly, a competence in its state institutions. And for all its diversity, China has a strong Han Chinese core, which has no counterpart in the linguistic and cultural diversity of India. So India's economy will be big, but it won't be as big as China, which is currently five times its size. Indeed, China's economy would virtually have to crash and India's grow at around 10% a year for that gap to be bridged, and I don't think either is very likely. The drivers of Indian economic growth are deeply structural, which is why I believe they're also quite sustainable. They include the urbanization of the world's largest rural population, the gradual movement of the informal economy, which employs some 90% of Indian workers, into the formal economy, a young demographic with a mean age of 27, now considerable investment in infrastructure and the beginnings of an ambitious program to upskill 400 million Indians. These structural drivers will likely keep India on a relatively strong growth path. And I've taken a relatively moderate view of India's forward economic trajectory, arguing that growth of six to eight percent per year over the next 20 years uh, is an entirely, entirely realistic assumption. Most of all, India has scale. Since 2000, its GDP has grown sevenfold, and it will, by 2035, overtake China in terms of population size. So this means a very deep domestic market, which will likely make India the, third, the world's third largest economy by 2035, measured by market exchange rates. It already has that status if you measure it by purchasing power parity. Now, scale obviously encourages ambition, but it's the structural complementarity between the Indian and Australian economies, which is the key to translating ambition into opportunities. Put simply, a growing Indian economy will need more of the things Australia is well-placed to provide, from education services to resources and energy, from food to healthcare, from tourist destinations to expertise in water and environmental management. Indeed, services are likely to be the fastest growing segment of our future economic relationship with India. So beyond scale and complementarity, there is a third very important re reason for bringing India into the first tier of our economic relationship, and that is spreading risk. Australia is a country which is fairly dependent on foreign investment and exports. For 40% of our exports to go to just two markets from a risk management point of view is probably not the best position to be in. At a time when the international environment is so uncertain, 
when the contribution of trade to global GDP growth is less than it has been for the last several decades, it simply makes sense for Australia to be diversifying its export and investment relationship. Now the report argues for a three-pillar strategy towards India, the economy, geopolitics, and a people-to-people -people relationship. The economic relationship, I argue, should be based on sectors where Australia has a competitive advantage and focused on states where those competitive advantages may be best exercised. The geopolitical argument relates to what's happening in our regional and international environment, and in particular to China's now quite clearly articulated ambition to be the predominant geopolitical power in the region. And how we deal with that while continuing to engage closely with China, but also to find a balance in the region which favours the interests of open democracies, in my view, will be one of the largest geopolitical challenges that Australia faces. And I think we can approach that challenge on the basis that we will find in India not an ally, because India will never be a strategic ally to Australia or anyone, but a country that has converging geopolitical interests with Australia. And I think we're already seeing that in the relationship. The third pillar, the people-to-people -people relationship, over time may well prove to be the most significant asset we have in developing the relationship with India. In the last decade, we've seen an enormous rise in the size of the Indian diaspora, which virtually doubled from 2006 to 2016, and it now stands at 700,000 strong, the, the, the fastest growing large diaspora in Australia. I think they will have a big role to play in the partnership of the future. They can go into the nooks and crannies of a relationship where governments cannot. They can shape perceptions in a way governments cannot. And they create personal links, whether it's in, the, in business or in the arts, education or civil society, which can help us to anchor this relationship. So the, so the report provides an analysis of how this diaspora community can play a role in building the business relationship uh, within, with India. It points to the likely growing political influence of the Indian diaspora, something which is already evident in state politics, if not yet in federal politics. As they have in Canada and elsewhere, I believe the Indian diaspora in Australia may prove over the next two decades to be the most politically active of any migrant group in Australian history since the Irish. And this will have the implications for the priority that our political leaders will place on the relationship with India. Now, I won't go into the details of the sectors and states that are outlined in the report because uh, you'll be able to uh, read them, but the essential rationale for all of that is to try and give the business community something that they can touch and feel. It's one thing to have the macro story of Indian growth, of Indian scale, of Indian economic reform. It's quite another thing to translate that big picture story into a strategy for entering the Indian market. Uh, and by refining where it is that we should focus by choosing 10 sectors. I've had education as the flagship sector, three other sectors which I call lead sectors, which are agribusiness, tourism, and resources. And by lead, I mean a prospect of Australia positioning itself within the top five of, in, of India's international partners. And then six sectors where we will essentially be niche providers but niche providers in what is uh, a very large market. Uh, and in relation to states, it's, it's essentially saying, don't think of India as a single 
national economy. Think of India as a series of state economies that are each driven by different dynamics, each led by different types of people, each with its own different comparative advantage, and each with a different level of commitment to economic reform. And it's the bringing together of the 10 sectors and the 10 identified states which really forms the core of the strategy that's outlined uh, in, in this report. Now I want to just say a few words about investment because the report gives a particular emphasis to investment. Um, and each of the sectoral papers in the report includes the prospects for two-way investment. So today, Australia's investment relationship with India is minuscule. Uh, and yet we are both countries highly dependent on foreign investment to lift our growth and standard of living. In virtually all of Australia's relationships in Asia, investment lags trade by a wide margin. India holds out the prospect of being a little bit different. It has a relatively open foreign investment regime, at least more open than its approach to trade. It has the rule of law, although long delays can erode that advantage. Its institutions are familiar to Australians, both derived from British models, and English is widely spoken, a very significant asset. In short, we may have a better chance with India to secure more balance between our trade and investment relationship than we have with any other major Asian economy. And that's why I think we should set this ambitious target of outward investment being 10 times greater than it is today. It's a, it's a big target from a low starting point, but attracting foreign investment is a key element in the Indian economic model. And over 20 years, India's policy framework on foreign investment will, I believe, become more and more open. So India also offers big opportunities in terms of long-term investment by Australian superannuation funds and the Australian expertise in areas such as infrastructure financing. Now, I spent quite a bit of my report talking about the role of government. I don't propose this afternoon to run through that in any, in any detail because I'd much rather focus uh, on the role of business given uh, this audience and given CEDA's role. Um, so just as government has a large role to play in an enhanced India economic strategy, so also do we need a stronger business relationship the current structure which underpins the business-to-business -to -business relationship are not, in my view, strong enough to support a larger trade and investment relationship. Our CEO forum is a useful vehicle, but it needs an agenda beyond its meetings, which themselves need to be brought into a much more regular cycle. Similarly, the Australia-India Business Council needs more clout. It should include the big corporates who do business in India, as well as the SME membership, which is its current focus. The AIBC also needs to broaden much further beyond the diaspora community and in the process be less susceptible to the factionalism which too often plagues diaspora groups. And I know these are issues that the leadership of the AIBC are very conscious of and are working hard to deal with. A more active role by the Business Council of Australia would be one means of strengthening the business-to-business -business relationship. The BCA, for example, would make a very good secretariat for the Australia-India CEO Forum, giving it some business heft and aligning it more closely with Australia's business priorities. There should also be a much closer relationship between the BCA and the Australia-India Business Council and the Indian industry groups and chambers which play such a key role in promoting Indian business links with its major trading partners. The current business-to-business -business architecture struggles to keep up with the existing relationship, let alone pave the way for the larger relationship we need to have. 
Its leadership is dedicated and eager to do more, but it is constrained by limited resources and a volunteer base. This must change and the government and others should do what it can to facilitate that change. So let me just offer a few concluding observations. This strategy is for the most part a strategy about Australia in India. For this partnership to be fully realised, we actually need an Indian strategy in Australia, a strategy for Australia from India. And I'm delighted that when the Indian Commerce Minister was here recently, he undertook to commission just such a strategy and I look forward to uh, seeing the, the fruits of that. In drafting the report, I've sought to navigate between those who believe India is the next China and that the challenges of doing business there are in the past and those who believe India will always be just too hard. There is no question that India will remain a challenging place to do business. But there is also no doubt in my mind that the balance sheet between opportunities and challenges clearly favours opportunities. Timing has always been a challenge in Australia's relationship with India. In the past, substance has lagged enthusiasm. Today, however, the risk is that we're not moving fast enough and that Australia might fall behind as other countries accord India a much higher priority. And I believe this is already happening in some areas. Momentum is important to all relationships and we can't afford to lose momentum or to assume that the logic of complementary interests will be enough to take the economic relationship to the level it needs to rise. Ultimately, of course, any strategy is only as good as the commitment which backs it and the resources and priorities which drive it. Taking the relationship with India to the level it deserves is a long haul journey. It will take leadership, time, effort, and consistent focus. No strategy goes exactly to plan, and I certainly don't expect this one to. And, and no one looking out 20 years can hope to capture change that we can only, if, not, if dimly see, not see at all. All strategies have to be nimble enough to adapt to the unforeseen, but the logic of a strategic investment by Australia in the relationship with India is, I believe, compelling. Thank you. <laughs>